We're going to do how we got here, part two. And I want to share this with you because this being what we call Christmas season is just an amazing time for me. You've, you've heard my story many times. This was always my favorite time of the year from the time I was a little boy. Even now, I love this season when we almost everything is put on hold. We stop things and we spend time. Uh, reminiscing, thinking about maybe our earlier days, but certainly we talk about Jesus on this day, perhaps like we don't throughout the year. And, and I'm, I'm not speaking of, of we don't as far as this fellowship is concerned, but generally speaking in the world. How we got here, there were some things that God said and then God did, and those things brought us to this day. Now, this is not just some, something we do. Uh, you know, the world talks about it. They've commercialized Christmas. It's all about profits and making money. Or, and to some people, it's just another uh, time to give, have a party. But for us, I think it's much more than that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it. And um, I'm going to do something kind of maybe a little bit strange. I'm, I want to read the genealogy in Matthew, in Matthew, how God meticulously, very carefully, painstakingly carefully, God ushered in his son or brought himself through his son into uh, the, the kingdom of men, a, a kingdom where we had messed everything up. Somebody might think that, uh, well, uh, the world is a great place. It is in one sense, but we messed a perfect environment up, and that's why we need Jesus. We don't need more uh, intellectualism. We don't need uh, more uh, thoughts and plans. We need Jesus, and this reminds us of that. Um, I, I know so often, and I'm never ever against education. I love education. I think we all ought to have as much as we can, but we cannot solve who we are by ourselves, nor can we solve who we are by more of what got us into this situation. We can't do that. So we need Jesus. And in the arena of men, when we say things like, we need Jesus, everybody thinks you're ignorant and unlearned. When you say, we need Jesus, they think that's ridiculous. We need more thoughtfulness. And what has thoughtfulness done for us but cause us to kick the can down the road another, another day, another year, or, uh, another week, another month, uh, you know, and for, for, so forth and so on. So... I w I'm just going to share a few things about the book of the genealogy of Jesus. And here we say in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, I'll read it somewhat fast. It says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, uh, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so you may ask, well, why does he say son of David, son of Abraham? He wants you to know that, that he is the result of the promise God made to Abraham. And that he is the one who has the right to rule. He is the son of David. And so David is the first person that God used on the planet. He wasn't the most likely person, but he was the first person that God used on the planet to usher in the kingdom of God. And God had a kingdom here on, on the earth. God had a, a kingdom. He had a place of worship. He had a house uh, there on, in Jerusalem. So let's look at this. He says the son of David, the son of Abraham. Then he tells you how God meticulously rules. God rules in the kingdom of men. So God meticulously caused everything to turn out without manipulating. He caused everything to turn out the way it was supposed to turn out. And if you want to understand God, you, you have to understand something by faith. That is that God lives in the eternal now. He does not, you know, it's not like God was, you know, yes, God was, but God is. And so wherever God was, he still is. But you have to understand that. Yeah, and, and, so, and so God is also in the future. So, so you, you and I haven't gotten there yet, but God already knows about it because he's there. He is everywhere. And this is what he wants us to understand. So meticulously, he writes, and Abraham 
uh, I'm sorry, Matthew writes this in a way that he chooses uh, 14 generations, uh, uh, three segments of 14 generations. Uh, it's not like Luke's genealogy, but let's read it. It's so amazing. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. And he wants you to know there was more than just a singular thing that happened. It was now a people group. He begot uh, his brothers. Judah, Judah begot Perez, 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 P-E-R-E-Z, and, and Zerah by Tamar. And uh, Tamar was uh, a Gentile woman. So he's showing you that God is for everybody. Uh, and uh, Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Amenadab, Amenadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, and uh, uh, Rahab was a Gentile girl, and she was not a very nice girl, but when she met Jesus, she changed. And so now, and so God shows you how he doesn't, he doesn't ostracize people, but he, he brought even these Gentiles into his family. And um, it says, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, another uh, Gentile girl. Well, it's amazing. And so we hear things that aren't always accurate. But it shows you how God is including people that we would have excluded here. Uh, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king, a very important point. Then David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah, a woman who had been caught, who had been caught in adultery by a king who used his power um, uh, unjustly, unrighteously uh, against her to bring her into this place. But she is in the genealogy of the Lord. You see how loving God is. So you, you may have done some things that are wrong, and uh, you, you, you cannot forgive yourself, but God forgives you. And this is what this genealogy is all about. God forgives you. Amen. And then he goes on to say, Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, and Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, or Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. That was another uh, division. That was the second one. So you'll find that Matthew does this for a particular reason. He shows you how particular God is in saving mankind. He shows you um, how God brought this about in a way that seems, as it were, impossible. And he, he's, I say again, including people that were excluded. He says here, let me read this again. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Ab Abiud. Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. And Azor begot J Zadok, and Zadok begot Akim, and Akim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mason, Mason, and Mason begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. And you see, he brings it down Mary into this. He's all these men are doing things, and he'll show you the, the women, and then he says, um, he shows us the last three are Jacob, Joseph, and Jesus, and Mary, of course, is there. So he says, all, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations, and from captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. So he wants to show you how meticulously God preserved a people. So what we gain from that is that God did that not just to show you what he could do in impossible situations, but he's showing, he is showing all of us how meticulously he brought you here today. Same. Same. And now you know God. You know God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just like everybody else. And, and so he says here, in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Matthew was a, 
a tax collector, and probably an accountant. And you see just how he is so meticulous. So God uses all of us. He uses all of us who just gather, and he, use, he uses those who are, are very, very careful and discreet as is Matthew. Now, the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph, she was engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And I know that there are a lot of inquiring minds and strange thinking people who say, yeah, I bet. And that's because you are fallen and your mindset is fallen. This is the Word of God. You say, well, how do you know, Pastor, this is the Word of God? Because he told me. That's how I know. It's that simple. He told all of us. And so he says here, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was a righteous man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, I like that word, behold, in Scripture. It's like a shock, you know. Behold, you know. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. That, that is so powerful. So, so Joseph was a just man. He was a righteous man, even though it looked like Mary had been fooling around. That's what it looked like to the natural mind. And so often you can find, you can see now why the scripture says that the carnal mind, the natural mind, is an enemy of God. It, it, has, it has hatred for God. Why? Because we think things that are not true and label truth on them. And this is what was happening here. But, but, listen, but Joseph was just. Joseph was righteous. And so he says, I'm not going, even, you know, even if she did something wrong, I'm just not going to just put her out there and let them stone her to death and kill her. Joseph is showing mercy, showing what it is to be a righteous person. You and I ought to show mercy to people who disagree with us, people who don't even like us, people who don't care about us. We should show mercy. We should show that we are righteous. And this is what we find at the coming of Jesus. So he didn't want to, he was going to put her away privately. So uh, to keep her out of, uh, out of the public ire, he didn't want her to be damaged, even though it looked like she had betrayed him. So what God did, God sent an angel to talk to him. God, and, and I believe this because God has spoken to me as well. Uh, someone was saying to me today, uh, one of our dear, dear brothers, about he had a dream. And I won't tell you who the brother is, but he had a dream. And in this dream, uh, it was one of those nightmares. And God sent someone in the dream, a, a pastor in the dream, to speak to it to calm the situation. God does those things. And there are people who say, well, I don't believe it. That's because you're an unbeliever. And you have to be converted. When you are converted, you become a believer. God, God inculcates himself. And then you will start to believe and to know. Believing doesn't mean that I'm mindless. It doesn't mean that. What believing is, is that you have now been elevated by God to a place that you could not go on your own. That's what believing is about. Uh, somebody said to me uh, uh, more than once, but I've talked to people about faith, and, uh, and I, I, I know I shock them when I say things like, yeah, it, I, I've said this many times, it's hard for me to believe that there's a God. It's also hard for me to believe there's not a God. I said, the problem is, I found the problem. The problem is, is that I, I, I'm created. And so, I, if I, if my natural person will always see things from a, a created point of view. So, since I am created, I think that everything has to be created. But what God does in faith, God takes you beyond created things. God takes you supernaturally. How does he do it? I don't know how he does it, but I do know he does it because he's done it for me and he's done it for a multiplicity of others. We were just like everybody else. And so he, one day he, would, he came to us and he elevated us, our thinking, everything about us into a place beyond creation. And we knew at that moment, it was the first time in our life, in our history, that we were lucid. It was the very first time and we suddenly realized God is. First time. 
And from that point, from that particular point, that juncture, we began to know by faith that God exists. And so God takes us beyond creation. This is an amazing thought. Jesus did that because Jesus, the, the, Paul tells us that Jesus um, uh, ascended higher, higher than the heavens. Wow, that's a big thought, isn't it? And so if you're a secular, if your mind is still secular, it's still carnal, it's still fleshly, it's still earthly, then you can't, you, you, you can't imagine that, you can't see that, and only what you can see, feel, touch, and smell is, uh, is real. That's right. But then, but God takes you somewhere. Yes. And, and God will take you. Paul says, Christ, when he arose from the dead, he ascended higher than the heavens. So what does that mean? If you go higher than the heavens, what, where are you? That means you are out on the other side of creation. You are actually on a place where only God exists. That's amazing. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. And so God sent, let me go back to my story. God sent an angel in a dream to Joseph because he was going to deal with Joseph through dreams. Now, now listen, everything you dream is in God. <laughs> so don't start to think you, you, you have too much pizza, too much bologna, and then you have these bad dreams, right? And you think, oh, this must be God. No, no, everything you dream is in God. But God began to deal with him in dream. And he said to him, Joseph, son of David. Now notice how he, he connects him with David, son of David, because Jesus has a right to rule for, because he is in the lineage of David, because Mary's lineage goes back to David. Uh, he is in the lineage of David, but but through because he came through the, the one that Matthew uh, recognized, Jeconiah, he says he can't sit on the throne. But he's still in the bloodline. But, but what through Joseph, Joseph, he can rule. That's big. That's big, isn't it? Isn't it big? Oh, you got very quiet. You go. Yeah. So let's go, let's go for it. So he, he said, um, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So we need to have, we need to have contact with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just to give you oozy goosebumps or to give you things that you didn't study or know. He's not just for that. But, but the, Holy, the Holy Spirit is, is God. He is not a God like uh, one of the gods. No, he is God. God is manifested in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, um, he says, then overshadowed Mary. This is what it was. Uh, I was in a place where a pastor got that all wrong, all messed up. I had to stand up and correct him. We were, we were all together. I think that, uh, uh, Lauren, I think you were there in that meeting, uh, in that place where we were. And I know you were. But anyway, what happens here is the Holy Spirit, God, just overshadowed her. And God, being uh, the Logos, Jesus is called the Logos. He's the Word of God, the thoughts of God. Uh, uh, he is God himself. And so what he did was he just overshadowed her and supernaturally just put his Word in her. He put his Word in her. And how his, his Word in her produced this baby that, that matured in the womb just like you or I. That's what God did. There was nothing dirty about it, quote unquote. There was nothing sexual, as we call about it, but there was m something spiritual about it. Yeah. And so, and, and verse 21 says, the angel said, and she will bring forth a son. She will bring forth a son. And you, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. And so we don't talk about sin because it's not so popular, but sin separates us from God. Jesus came to bring us to God. So we, we uh, sang a song about being reconciled today. So Jesus reconciled us to God. He didn't reconcile God to us because God didn't go anywhere. But he reconciled us back to God. And, and so he says, she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that 
it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying. Now, this is amazing. This was um, like a, uh, approximately 700 years before. You see, sometimes God tells us things, and we know that God spoke something to us, but we think, we get impatient, and we think, well, it must have just been me. I'm, I'm just the, I have been the master. I'm not at this juncture, but I've been the master of that must have been me. No, one of my favorite words in the Spanish language is cachetada. <laughs> it, it means I needed slaps. Pow, pow, pow. Because that must have been me. 700 years later, God decides he's going to bring this to pass at 700. It wasn't like God is whimsical. He's not whimsical. He's not capricious where he just does things arbitrarily. No, he had always planned to do it at that time. That's amazing of God. Thank you so much. You're encouraging me there. <laughs> and so he says, so all this was done, all the genealogical record, all of the interaction, even the bad stuff. God didn't intend the bad stuff, but God didn't have to go around the bad stuff. God just enfolded it and just kept on going. Wow. So even your mistakes, my mistakes, God enfolds them, and he makes us better. Because sometimes we're seeking the Lord and seeking the Lord because oh, I wish I had not, I wish I had not, I should not have. And God just takes all of that and makes you even better as you go forward. How does he do it? Amazing, amazing. God is amazing. And I, I would that everyone knew God like you and I know God. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, that it might come to pass. It might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, is the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child. Now, that was an impossibility. I'm sure that somebody heard Isaiah say that and saw it writing. What does he mean? Now, it had an immediate uh, fulfillment. It was an immediate fulfillment, but it was predictive of the future. And what do you, does he mean? And the virgin shall uh, be with child. A virgin can't be with child. Yes, through God she can. And bear a son, capital S-O-N. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. God with us. And so Jesus Christ is God with us. And so if you're an unbeliever today, you may say, well, Jesus is not around here today, so what? He is by his spirit. And he is in his people. The, the, one of the great mysteries is, is that we're all walking around here thinking we're all the same, and we're not. We all look the same on the outside, but we're not all the same on the inside. There are people who have God living in them, and you may not. And if you don't, don't misjudge. God is living in that vessel. Look the same outside, but we are so starkly different on the inside. God with us. And from the time Jesus came, God has been with us in his people group. Verse 24, verse 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name, what? Jesus. He called his name Jesus. Now, let me read from Ma Matthew 2. I will read this. This is the vis visit of the wise men or the magi, those who studied the stars and knew things uh, that were uh, going to happen. We're not talking about these, uh, these uh, people who, uh, these freaky people who are going around reading people's palms and, and doing that. We're not talking about, <laughs> it's not the same. So let, let's look at Jesus then coming. Because from the moment Jesus came to the earth, he's not left. Yes, he has ascended bodily to heaven, but he stayed here also in his people through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Verse 1 of Matthew 2 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. 
When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod was troubled because if there was a king born, that means he was an illegitimate king. And he was illegitimate, by the way. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so this wicked Herod, he, what did he do when he was in trouble? He gathered the, gathered the priests, the scribes, and God's people. <laughs> and that's what will happen in the days to come. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So everybody wants to believe the prophet now. But you, Bethlehem, this is what the prophet says. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Who will shepherd my people Israel. I'm going to just leave it right there. I'm going to leave it right there. And, and in the next service, I will take it a bit further. But he says, out of you will come a, uh, a ruler who will not just, as it were, rule, but who will shepherd, will have a tender heart, will have loving care for you. And that's who Jesus is, and that's what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has secured for the believer that which the believer could have no other way. And there, there are so many, especially young people. My dad told me a story once, told me, a, uh, said to me, I was talking to him about a particular situation. And he said to me, son, don't be, don't be so surprised or bothered. He said, when the enemy touches something good or somebody good, don't, don't like be overwhelmed. Because if Satan does not touch something or someone good, he hasn't done anything. Therefore, he is always trying to corrupt something good. He's always trying to damage something good. But this is what my father said. No matter who that person is, when, when uh, our children have a promise that they will be taught of the Lord and great will be their peace. And he says, don't worry about it. God will yet do what he said. And this is what we see here. God will yet do what he said. So I want to just pray, but I want to ask a question. Then we're going to pray. If this has touched you and you want to give your heart to Jesus, whether you're online or here in the sanctuary, and you want to give your heart to Jesus, I want you to just think about it in just a moment. We're going to have some music. We're going to serve communion. But I want you to think about it. And if you want to, you say, well, Pastor, I want to recommit myself to the Lord. I, I, I want you to think about that too. And I want you to take this seriously because one of these days, one of, you, one of these days, you won't have an opportunity. There's a, in Matthew 25, we don't have time to tell you everything, but in Matthew 25, there's a story about 10 uh, virgins, they're all virgins, but five were wise and five were foolish. And the foolish ones had lanterns. They were going to meet the bridegroom. That's Jesus. And they didn't carry any extra oil, and the bridegroom was delayed. And their lamps started to go out, and they wanted to borrow some from those five who brought extra oil. They said, well, I'm sorry, we can't give you any of our oil because there might not be enough for me. And we're thinking about the bridegroom coming, and we want to be a part of his wedding party. He said, you need to go and find, find it somewhere else. Go buy some, but I'm sorry, we can't give you mine. And so when they went to buy, the bridegroom came. I want you to really listen very attentively to this. The bridegroom came, and when he came, he closed the door. And they came back trying to get him to open. He said, I don't know you. But, but, we, but no, I don't know you. I don't know where you're from. And, and this is why we preach the gospel is because once Jesus comes, Jesus has given many of us a lifetime. He's given me 76 years plus. And he's given some of you 20 years or 30 years or, or 15 years or whatever. And that's enough time to say yes to him. So I'm going to pray for you. I bless you. In the name of Jesus, and I thank God for you that he would stir your heart and that you would accept his invitation to be a part of his family.